Just Outdoors is brought to you by the following community supporters. Jervalin Hardware Hank, Deer River. Jervalin Hardware offers a broad selection of paints and sporting goods and a complete line of plumbing and electrical supplies. Jervalin Hardware, 108 Main Avenue, Deer River. Meridian Medical Clinic. Located in Grand Rapids, Meridian Medical Clinic is dedicated to providing quality medical care for every stage of life. Meridian offers a variety of family practice services, including on-site laboratory and digital radiography. Meds One Emergency Medical Services. Meds One provides mobile advanced life support, critical care response, and comprehensive EMS support services, such as response planning, education, event standby, and consulting. Hi, my name is Tom Chapin and welcome to Just Outdoors. This is a program to bring you the bare facts about the waters, woods, and wildlife of Itasca County. And today we have uh, three special guests with us. Uh, we're going to be discussing um, the hunting and fishing initiative, meaning basically the proposed increase in the license fees that people are hearing about out there. And uh, I've got just the people here to uh, Describe a little about that initiative and tell us um, just exactly what it's about. And I will introduce them myself. Uh, the first one is uh, Dave Wetzel. Dave, you're the Assistant Area Fisheries Manager. Yep, that's for correct. For the Grand Rapids area. Okay, and you're going to be discussing the uh, connection with this increased license fees proposed uh, involving the fishing area. Yep. And we have Tom Sutherland, he's a uh, local uh, district conservation officer for Grand Rapids yep. and you're going to be discussing uh, the involvement with enforcement and the uh, initiative how that's going to help your division which is down significantly with numbers of people in the field and then we have Perry Legrain you're the area wildlife manager for the Grand Rapids area yes. and uh, everybody around here hunts and uh, deer hunting and grouse hunting and duck hunting and the pheasant hunting and they're going to talk about how it involves your division. Mm -hmm. So I guess the first thing we want to start out with is that uh, you know hunting and fishing is really woven into the the fabric of uh, Minnesota culture. I mean there's like two million people that uh, buy fishing licenses in the state. There's like 700,000 hunters, whether it be deer hunters or grouse hunters or duck hunters. Um, there's about $3.6 billion from this hunting and fishing that goes into our economy. And I guess there's directly, there's 55,000 jobs in the state that's supported by hunting and fishing. So it's a big deal here. And so when people hear about the increase in fishing and hunting fees, uh, they get a little nervous. Some of it they don't understand why we need an increase, and yet it's been about 11 years, coming on 11 years since there's been any increase. It's hard for me to understand how you could run a business, let alone a, a public operation, without some sort of increase, with all the increase in uh, gas and all the other things that 
work into your job. So we're going to be discussing that part of it and see if uh, we can get uh, the public out there to more understand why this is a, a needed thing for for our uh, our culture here. Um, Okay, who I don't know, you just want to take these questions as they come, whoever wants to grab one. Uh, I'm going to start asking some questions here. Uh, the first one is generally how does the DNR spend license dollars? That's, uh, that's the big thing because you go out and you buy a fishing license, a hunting license, where does that money go and, and how is it spent uh, out there in the field? Anybody? Well, in general terms, uh, when you buy your license, that money goes into what's known as the Game and Fish Fund. Uh, so that's money that's available for us to, to use for our various programs. And it's divided up fairly equally among wildlife, fisheries, and enforcement. Um, fisheries is a little bit bigger agency just because of the number of lakes we have. So I think our share is somewhere around 30% and then a little bit less for the other two divisions. Um, but more specifically within fisheries, uh, you know, we have a lot of different activities that we do that are directly related to uh, the quality of product that we're able to put out. Um, and we spend a lot of our time actually doing projects in the field. You know, in the winter time, we're analyzing a lot of data and writing reports and summarizing what we find. But from April through October, we're actually out in the field either uh, stocking fish or producing fish or we're collecting data that helps us manage the lakes. Uh, so that's kind of a big part of what we do. Um, you know, probably the, in terms of dollars spent, we probably spend uh, more money on um, doing fish survey work than anything because that's kind of the basis for how we manage our fisheries. Because uh, we need that information to make important management decisions, stocking rates, um, what kind of uh, species is most appropriate in a type of lake. And then fish production is another major cost. Uh, we stock somewhere around 390 million walleyes in this state and it takes a lot of time and money to produce those fish. Okay. A lot of things people don't understand how involved this is. Well, it's very it involved. Yeah. And, and the, uh, the economics of it is just uh, ridiculous when it comes to the variance in the, in the cost of some of these things from year to year. Right. It just changes a lot. So, uh, you know, we're looking at 11 years without an increase. So it's, it's really something that, uh, you know, folks have to look at if they're involved in hunting and fishing and so on. What about wildlife? Is that... Well, wildlife has a slightly different uh, uh, percentage on how we do our work. We, we do a, a fair amount of the population assessment work. Uh, we set the deer season. We find, you know, we work on determining what the, uh, you know, what we have for deer populations, rough grouse, waterfowl mm -hmm. populations. Um, however, we do ha also have uh, habitat work. We have an extensive wildlife management area system throughout the state, uh, over 1.3 million acres, over a thousand units. Um, and we do habitat management on those public lands, and we also do help uh, up in the northern forest. Uh, Itasca County has, uh, I think, close to about four and a half million acres of public forest lands, uh, both under state, county, and federal jurisdiction. We, uh, in our office, we work with those foresters mm -hmm. to uh, work on uh, a lot of different types of projects, timber sale design, um, and also habitat work on other things. Uh, so we work uh, extensively with uh, other land managers, especially up here. We uh, up here we um, work with the shallow lakes, wild rice management, uh, through partners like Ducks Unlimited, uh, various uh, lake associations, that sort of thing, through uh, wild wild rice management for waterfowl. And so, uh, rather than you know dealing with just primarily population management, we we do a lot of uh, things that do impact uh, on the ground type things that have wildlife specifically and um, and so it's it's a little bit different um, but it's still the same thing these are core activities that we have yeah. and uh, result in the, the products yeah. that we produce that's why you, you three are here because the money that, that comes in from license fees generally goes to most of it almost all I guess all of it goes to uh, uh, wildlife fisheries and enforcement so. right uh, the rest of the DNR, the forestry and, uh, and the other divisions of the DNR, that's mostly out of general funds. The general funds, the tax money, basically, doesn't support your divisions. It's right. strictly from... Very small yeah, amounts. Yeah, and, and Tom, what about your uh, division? How is this, uh, how, how are your dollars spent? Basically, the two-thirds of our budget, a little over $20 million, um, mm -hmm. um, comes from the Game and Fish Fund directly from the uh, licenses and the uh, federal 
federal dollars that come in through the Roberts and Pittman Act um, mm -hmm. on uh, uh, the tax on hunting and fishing equipment. So a large portion of our budget does come from these from these fees. Only five percent comes from the general fund, um, which is the taxpayer dollars. Yeah. Large amount comes from them. Basically. Um, we have 155 field officers that work in the field, basically the same amount of number of officers that's been in the field since 1940. Yeah. Uh, the population of the state of Minnesota has doubled over 5 million from that time, and our field officers are basically the same. We roughly cover about 650 square miles each officer. Um, and what we do is we enforce the game and fish laws that are out there. Um, the fisheries that's made the laws that's have made the recommendations hey this this lake needs a five fish limit okay we go in and we make sure that's being abided by and the citizens are following the law which has uh, been very very good um, it's worked out really well the the people are uh, um, violation rates locally have been very low um, very yeah my, what is the, has been the compliance rate on late let's say fishing licenses uh, is it Pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty good. You know, I'd say one out of a mm hundred -hmm. people don't have a yeah. don't have a license, which is uh, and, and hunting licenses. I'm sure same same, same aspect. Same thing, yeah. A lot of people know they need to. That money goes into you know providing habitat mm -hmm. and providing fisheries with money and, and enforcement to get out there and do the work that's that's needed. Um, you know, game and fish. It's not only game and fish. You know, in our job, especially enforcement. Now it's ATV enforcement, snowmobiles, and right. recreational, 19, enforcement, recreational yeah. enforcement. And the biggest and the latest yeah. is the exotic species, the invasive species that have come to the state of Minnesota and are working our way into our lakes. And um, That's going to increase, areas. isn't it? I mean, yeah. it seems like uh, in fisheries and wildlife gets involved with that too, but uh, yeah. especially fisheries too with that. It's just uh, amazing because you can't read an article about uh, any enforcement work or fisheries work where there isn't some sort of an exotic species situation, and it seems like it's there's something new every year. It seems like uh, it seems like every week I'm getting an email on a lake that uh, you know has a new yeah. new invasive species in it. So. I think it's in northern Minnesota. We're am I right? We're we're kind of protected from some of that because of our colder climate here. But there is still chances for a lot of this stuff to yeah, there's to, to go north, right? There, there's a heck of a lot of it that could survive <laughs> here without any problem. How about so, these fish that they're talking about? These are they big mouth the carp or whatever? Or is Asian that carp. Uh, Asian carp? Asian carp are, yeah. are those something that uh, there's uh, a possibility of those working their way into our our fisheries in Itasca County, or is that th there's a possibility? But with the Asian carp, what, what you, a lot of people don't understand is they just like any fish species they have certain habitat requirements so they're going to do best um, especially in like a larger river and real productive waters uh, you get up into our real clear deep lakes in Itasca County and um, there's other fish species that are much better suited for those environments mm -hmm. so they'd probably not be a real big concern here um, kind of some of our bigger concerns would be the faucet snail which we find in Winnie and causes yeah. big duck die-offs um, that that could very easily be spread throughout the area, uh, and then some of the plants, uh, curly leaf pondweed and Eurasian milfoil or two that we're really keeping an eye out for and um, trying to treat them when we find them. Okay, good. Well, uh, you know, you, you, we could talk just about that particular thing for 45 minutes, but uh, let's get back to the license uh, fee, this initiative that they're talking about. Um, what what's being recommended now? Um, What's being recommended as far as the increases in the licenses right now with the legislature? Well, uh, essentially, it, we've uh, the department or the division, uh, the department has taken a look and and kind of um, did a little bit more homework uh, this time around than we have. We generally have uh, a license fee increase about once every seven years or eight years. And oftentimes we just take the same license structure and we just mm -hmm. add a certain percentage increase that we think we need to be able to, to operate through the next time period. This year we actually hired some consultants and took a look at who was buying licenses, how long they were, or how often they were buying licenses, and uh, looked at other structures for licenses that and introduce some or we're proposing some new licenses that are different than what we have in the past 
and and uh, looking at our uh, maybe the fees may not be going up on certain licenses as much as others. So um, and what we found out from those that uh, from those consultants is this the first time that's been done? I believe this so. consultant thing. So yeah, you're have. trying to accommodate the public, right? A little more and get more specific on what they need. So go ahead. And we we find out that uh, a lot of our uh, clientele are very casual users. Uh, they may not hunt or fish every year. A lot, a large percentage of them do not hunt and or fish every year. Uh, really? They, they may maybe only hunt or uh, fish maybe a couple days and sometimes that may uh, may or may not um, uh, convince them that it's worth it to buy a license for a whole year to maybe hunt or fish for a weekend. So we've came up with a number of uh, other options, uh, shorter term licenses both in the hunting and fishing side that allow residents, we've had uh, to, to hunt uh, and fish for shorter periods of time and we have an, uh, a 90 day fishing license, a three day fishing license, a three day small game license. And also we have very dedicated clientele that hunt and fish every year. And so we've looked at those folks and they've said, well, we wouldn't mind buying a license that would last us for three years. Mm. So we have some licenses, you can buy a fishing license for three years now. I get a little break. Um, we also have a hunting license and for the, the same thing. Also have a uh, license if you do everything you can buy a license that will give you a hunting, hunting privileges for hunting, small game, uh, waterfowl, pheasant, trout and a, and a big game mm -hmm. a deer tag as well and you can buy that in all one license. Um, and, uh, and we've also uh, cut the prices for youth ages the uh, up to 17 most licenses are half price for those folks um, so that we don't have that burden on the on the families uh, also we you know hopefully it's a, a seemingly better economics you can introduce a youth to to hunting mm -hmm. and fishing and um, so when you take all of this and, and average it out it's about a 15 percent increase across the board. 15 percent across the board depends yeah. on your choice right yeah. on what, what you decide to do but what I'm hearing you say is that uh, you're adjusting um, <clears throat> the license fees to help accommodate people who don't uh, first of all what you mentioned was that don't hunt or fish a lot and it's just kind of a casual choice for them maybe they come up to their cabin uh, am I gonna go hunting or fishing today am I gonna go fishing particularly um, no nah, I don't think I'm gonna go down and buy a license um, I'm only up here a couple times a year. I just, I'll do something else. Mm -hmm. So, are, are you hoping or are you hopeful that maybe some of these folks, uh, because of the license fee being less than a regular license, like the three day license, uh, hunting and fishing, uh, that they'll more likely buy a license and that's more people put into the field and enjoying the resource? Right. And, and by, capturing or not cap but allowing those folks to participate and we take in you know we look at that as revenue lost so that if we uh, the, the person that may only buy a license once every five years now buys a short-term license at a reduced rate every year that probably results in in you know more money being brought in and so we feel we don't have to raise the the initial or the the base some of those base right. licenses yeah. is high the other the other point is that we um, we have the uh, um, hunters and fishermen pay a tax to the federal government of about 11 percent for hunting and fishing equipment and these mm -hmm. funds are then redistributed back to the states based on the number of hunting and fishing licenses that are sold and by increasing or having our numbers staying the same or increasing and as far as licenses sold we are then eligible for more funding or more of those dollars coming back into the state and mm -hmm. for all of us that mark that's somewhere between i believe 20 or 30 percent of our budget is this federal what we could call federal aid or this excise taxes on hunting and fishing equipment so and, it's, they, and they count the numbers of of people number of licenses sold that's right? correct that, that's yes. what they're looking at yeah. that total there mm -hmm. so they can set the amount of money that comes back right so correct. uh the more uh, licenses you can sell at any price 
well, not at any price, but at a reasonable price, uh, the better it is for incoming federal funds right. for that. Okay. Yeah. Tom, uh, while you're in the field, uh, what do you hear about this? Do you, do you, 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 you must hear, talk to people while you're checking licenses. Uh, they must have heard about the increases. Uh, what are mo where are most people's minds on this? Consensus is most people I've talked to, and people are starting to hear about it now r real recently here, um, the people that are out enjoying the outdoors, want to see it for their kids, to the future, mm -hmm. the protection. So most of the people that I'm talking to, that I'm seeing, the sportsmen I'm checking, are in favor of it, um, you know, as long as it's a minimal increase. And uh, they still feel that they're out in the field a lot of the time in the year, and it's a, it's a, it's a real... Uh, it's a real cheap way of, you know, getting out and having a hobby. It really you know, is, isn't it? it? I mean, when you, so when that's the way most that. people are looking at yeah. it. You know, I can get yeah. out for this amount of dollars, and what else can I do? I can't go to the movies for that, yeah. you know, and I can go fishing for the whole year. There's no time so. restriction. There's no season restriction. Uh, it's any day you want to go out and enjoy. Under a license, you, you can certainly do something out there. Right. If you're if you're so inclined, you know. Uh, Dave, uh, how does this compare uh, the, the license fee increase and uh, the proposed license fee increase and those prices for those licenses compared to like uh, back in the 70s? Uh, well, what we find is that uh, if you look at the cost of a license in 1970, it was $4. So it seems like if you look at a dollar to dollar comparison, it's a lot more expensive today. But the truth of the matter is when you factor in inflation, a fishing license should cost $22 and right now it costs 17 um, so some people uh, have said that they feel like an increased license fee would be too costly. They'd be paying more than they have in the past. But actually, we try to keep those license fees uh, pretty well level if you look at it in terms of inflation. Okay. And, you know, the money that comes in, uh, there's, there's no doubt, like any company or any organization, uh, the majority of the money goes to uh, wages. Isn't that correct? Yes. For people... Uh, who have expertise in their fields to go out and work for the public with those expertise uh, uh, items that they bring with them mm -hmm. in, in their job. And uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, wages are a big thing. Uh, yeah. And in and, and, and a job like promoting and protecting the resources of Minnesota, that's, that's what you're paying for. You're paying for professionals to uh, manage uh, whatever system you're involved with here. So. Excellent. Um, so we talk about specific license changes now and which ones. Uh, the first one I have on my list here is uh, the basic annual uh, husband and wife combination license. That's probably one of the most purchased license maybe yeah, when that's it comes a, to the, the hunting and the fishing. It's, it's a popular license and it's a nice option for people to be able to go out and buy that license. I know that's the, my wife loves the fish so that's the license that I typically okay, buy. Okay, explain the license and explain what the fees are, would be on something like well, that. Well, what, uh, what the license does, you can go and buy one license on with the combination that allows you and your spouse to be able to go out and fish. Um, and what we find is there is a little bit of a price discount uh, on that second license to do that, but most people really do it for the convenience factor. And when we did the market research, that's, that's what a lot of people were saying is, we want our license package to be more convenient. Sure. So the more convenient we can make it, the happier they are with it. Um, but uh, I'll have to take a look at my sheet real quick. Uh, the costs on a resident uh, husband and wife combination was $25. And the proposal is to go to $40 on that, um, compared to just a single annual resident, uh, which was 17 and that would go to 24 under the proposal. Okay. All right. So uh, are, there, are there many people that just buy hunting licenses? Uh, anybody know that? I mean, is there a figure out there? So a lot of people don't fish, but yet they hunt. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's, there's really no savings there other than they don't, they're not buying the, the fishing license. But um, I know a lot of people go out and buy the, it seems like the, the, the husband and wife license, even if their wife doesn't fish, but in case she fishes. Right. It's kind of a safety net. Right. It seems like, yeah. something like that. So, and I, I think a lot of people run into that situation where they're up at the weekend. Right. Uh, up at the cabin for the weekend, 
And, uh, you know, maybe the weather's really nice and that day their spouse does want to go out and fish. And, it, and it's pretty convenient to have already purchased that license instead of having to run into town and purchase a separate license for the spouse. Yeah. So in a lot of times it might make the difference whether that person fishes or not. Sure. Sure. Okay, how about uh, you hear a lot, there's been a lot in the uh, newspapers and uh, outdoor news about non-residence fees for hunting and fishing licenses. It seems to be a big thing with folks. They, uh, they're, they're, there's nobody in between on that. Right. Um, some people want them raised real high. Some folks say, hey, they bring in a lot of money, non-residents into the state, and uh, they should be at a fair price. So what are your feelings on this? Uh, and what is the proposal? Um, the proposal for non-resident would be to go from, uh, let's see, we've got the current price for non-resident angling at 39.50 and it would only go up to 44. So when you look at terms of a percentage compared to the increase in the resident fee, the resident fee increase would be bigger. Um, but what people don't realize, you know, when we're talking about this 10 year period without a fee increase, that was for resident anglers. We actually have had some non-resident fee increases during that time period. Uh, a lot of that was to offset the revenue lost when we changed the requirements for uh, ice shelters. Mm -hmm. um, so the non-residents have had some increases. And then the other thing that we see is the number of non-resident licenses that we've sold over the past decade has actually declined. So we don't want the cost of the license to be a reason why people don't come to Minnesota to fish. So we're trying to find a price that um, you know wouldn't uh, take that option off the mm -hmm. table for people. Okay, sure, that makes sense. Uh, how about sportsman's licenses? People go out and buy sportsman's licenses. Uh, yeah, the, the, that uh, is, uh, is, of course, increasing as well. And what is a sportsman's license? A sportsman's license, license is the uh, ability for a person to purchase a hunting, a small game hunting license and a resident angling license together. And, of course, the, they always give you kind of a reduced rate. And uh, it's going to go up, it's going to change from uh, $29.50 is the current price and the proposed is uh, $43 which I think you get a couple dollar um, price break on that and of course your your um, your stamps are not included you can um, your state and federal stamps are not included in that right but okay. then you can get we have added a super sport package and um, what is a super sport package? that is for the person that does it all uh, essentially, <laughs> it's a uh, it's a brand new one, and it, here again from our uh, uh, information that there are people that were, are interested in this, and you can sure. you can get a, an angling small game, uh, a deer tag. Okay, you can go grouse hunting, you can go fishing, you can go deer hunting. Right, and you also get a duck stamp, so you can do. Oh, you get a duck, a state duck state stamp. State duck stamp. Okay. A state pheasant stamp, and a state trout stamp. Wow. For ninety nine dollars. So. So you can basically for, do everything. For $100. For $100. You can go out and use our resources any time of the day. Yep. All year Every long. day, all year long for 100 bucks. That's uh, about a tank and a half of gas now, right? Right. Yep. <laughs> no, maybe a tank in a couple of weeks. But <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So what other, are there any other um, types of licenses? Well, the, the other thing with? that they looked at, because we, we've found that we have a lot of casual uh, or people that don't buy a license, either hunting or fishing every year, mm -hmm. we've uh, created a, uh, a number of shorter duration licenses. Uh, we have a 90 day angling license. 90 day, so. Right. And that's I'm trying to think of why a person would buy a 90 day license, probably just for summer fishing. Summer maybe. fishing. Yep, or vice versa. There's a lot of people that work all summer and never get a day off and only ice fish. Okay, so they, that would be an option on that list of licenses you go down that might fit for me. So there's those people out there. Might be only be five or 10% of the public, but yet it's available or would be available. Mm -hmm. yep. And then and what uh, else? Then a uh, three day uh, angling license. And now uh, that's something we haven't had before for a resident, is it? That's correct. Um, uh, heard a lot of complaints on that over the years, Tom, uh, where they wanted a, 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 a shorter license. Some people like to come up maybe from the Twin Cities just for the weekend, and that three-day license fits the Friday, Saturday, Sunday for them, and maybe that's the only weekend they're going to hit the cabin for the year. 
and it's a little bit cheaper for them. It's another option, um, so where they don't have to buy the full year license. So I think yeah. it, I think it will. Uh, uh, some people will like that. There was a, there was a shorter license for non-residents. Yep, there was but the three days. There was never for the anything for uh, but uh, no, no, never uh, for the resident. A resident. Right. So uh, yeah, if you think you're you got a friend up at the cabin and uh, it's the only time he's going to fish all year and you got a chance to go out and save a little money. Correct. Or something like that. So what else you got? Um, the other one that we have a three day small game license um, and that um, is nineteen dollars and you don't have to buy any stamps so really essentially that's a here again it's a weekend somebody gets uh, you know has a friend that wants him to go hunting with him and that's you know big stumbling block I'm only got one day, one or two days chance to hunt all year and they'll say well I don't want to buy a license and they don't go so this way you know you can go with your friend uh, hunt for the weekend and you just buy one piece of paper you don't have you if you duck hunt you still have to buy a federal stamp right but but there's no state no state. waterfall stamp you have to buy right or you and can go pheasant hunting pheasant for a weekend hunting. and you don't have to buy a state stamp so that eight is that eighteen dollars you said uh, nineteen nineteen dollars that's uh, a fairly good investment right especially if you hunt those two critters right yep. if you add on the ducks add on the pheasants uh, and some people Maybe they only go pheasant hunting once, or they only go pheasant hunting, and it's pheasant hunting once. Uh, it's a pretty good deal for that. It, it seems in my experience, especially like pheasant hunting when it's kind of a destination hunt, that there is a lot of opening weekend folks that, you know, mm -hmm. and they may not go back for a, a second time, and, and uh, or, or there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of folks that, that do hunt opening days or opening weekends with a, as a, um, with a social as a social thing with with a group of uh, friends and relatives and stuff yeah. and we have such a strong culture here and um, people kind of drop away but they still they still get into the social aspect of all this stuff and and so they, this allows them to to yeah. participate without buying a purchasing a full license how are license sales generally fishing hunting uh, sales in Minnesota over the last 30, 40 years. Are they, uh, are, are generally sales going down according to the, number, the population? Are they flat? Well, with, with fishing license, what we see is, um, if you look at it in terms of the percentage of the population that fishes because our population has increased, they've actually gone down, but in terms of the actual number of licenses sold, it's actually pretty stable for fisheries. The numbers of licenses sold are yep. not stable, but yet, so, so percentage-wise, it's going down. There's a lot. There's a lot more metropolitan people, people that haven't related or probably will never relate to the outdoors. Yeah, or they've maybe never been exposed to it. Exposed to it. Yeah, that's another problem, isn't it? You're talking about youth and so on. Yeah. How about hunting licenses? It's been fairly steady. Um, this these last this last decade we had a, a a slight bump in deer license sales but i don't think it was what you'd call significant and basically we feel pretty good about that because according you know based on other states our you know thing hunting is dropping off uh fairly fast uh, we have seen a, a fairly large decline in in waterfowl hunting about a third sure. that's because of the and we have the other waterfall. we have other issues there, sure. and and so uh, but we'd have seen a, a fairly steep decline in that. But by okay. and large, everything else is 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 fairly steady. Yeah, with these new proposals and uh, the the prices where they're going to supposedly be, um, how do we relate to other states? Um, are we kind of in the middle, or yeah, where are we? We're very much in the middle. Um, and even even with these increases, we'd stay in the middle. We'd only move up. Uh, you know, I think we're somewhere around 30th in the nation for the cost of our fishing license, and we'd, we'd go up maybe by a couple of states as all. Well. So we're we're still going to be in the middle of the pack, which is a pretty good deal considering Minnesota is a top five destination for fishing. Yeah, and one of the only states that's not a uh, coast state, right? That has such. Uh, just such a prevalence of, of lakes and, right. and fisheries. Yeah, just we're amazing. 
the yeah. number one inland water fishery destination yeah. in the country, Minnesota. Yeah. So we're lucky there. Yeah. Well, Tom, when you check people here, um, especially people from out of the area, uh, what's their attitude here when they when they're you know, sitting up, they're sitting on a pristine lake up north of Grand Rapids here, and uh, they're out there on a beautiful day. Uh, do they ever talk about the reason they're there other than just the fishing? I mean, the fact yeah. that they're, they, do they know they're in a special area? Yeah, you know, most of the people that come <laughs> out uh, come from other states. You know, we have a lot of people from Illinois, yeah, sure. Iowa, Wisconsin, and Ohio, and out east that come here, and they say this is the only place they feel like um, it's in the original pristine uh, way before people came, and that's yeah. that's really what we have in Minnesota. We're it's a, it's we're still in the natural state. A lot of our areas they're great. I mean, we get people around the world that come and visit here, and uh, they're very happy that Minnesota hasn't hasn't changed a, a lot. You know, mm -hmm. especially in northern Minnesota with all of our lakes and our pristine waters. You know, they feel it's one of the only places that hasn't changed. Their home state, maybe Ohio. Sure. They can't go to that lake that they were in their childhood, you know, because maybe of pollution concerns and fish die-offs. Where in Minnesota, we really uh, we're really lucky Bless with the you. resource that we have. So yeah. people are really happy to come here. Yeah, and the fact that, uh, like you mentioned, that for less than a hundred dollars, they can do everything here for a whole year, mm -hmm. as far as their hunting and fishing. It's just uh, really amazing. On that. Uh, how about some of the non-resident uh, fees? Uh, not we talk about non-resident license, but uh, what are generally the fees for a non-resident to come here uh, deer hunting? Well, the the right now we're getting more and more. It seems like non-resident deer hunters in Minnesota. Uh, do you see that, Tom, at all? Yeah, you know, it, I see it, a lot of people amazing. from our surrounding states that come here because yeah. right right now, especially if you look at some of the out west states, the People do go out there elk hunting, destination hunts, but I'll tell you what, the prices out there are really high for a license. You come to Minnesota, big game hunting, it's a real value right now. And even after the proposed yeah. license fees uh, raises, mm -hmm. it's a real value to come here. Yeah. And, and the managers, the wildlife managers have done a good job managing the deer herd. So people are coming here. Yeah. And the question of whether we want to raise it uh, out of crazy proportions, uh, you know, what do you, what's your opinion on that? And what are the fees on some of that? Well, it, right now you can buy a non-resident deer hunting license for $140, and we would uh, bump that up to $160, $20 increase. And uh, that's probably still a bargain. Most states are at least $200 for that that uh, license. And uh, the so. It, you know, you look at it both ways. You can say, well, they get people coming out of from out of state to to utilize our resource, um, and you know, why shouldn't we charge them more money? But yet, we also have family members that have moved away and come for that tradition of opening day of deer season yeah. to be in the deer shack with everybody. And should we, you know, charge those folks? They are original Minnesotans. They have roots back here. Uh, you know, there's a little balance yeah, you hear both, that. both mm -hmm. ways sure. uh, that, you know, that there's a, uh, you know, that both ways it seems to have that. So it's, it's fairly, uh, uh, you know, it's fairly high priced, but yet it's still modest by other states' modest, concerns. Yeah, sure. The other, uh, the other one, uh, the non-resident small game, uh, we do have a, uh, we've given an opportunity for a three-day small game. Uh, non-resident license and that um, is um, that'll be $75 here again no stamps are required and uh, in our small game annual uh, uh, with the stamps included is 112 which is about par with most neighboring states uh, small game hunting license is about $100 uh, usually 110 but you know they usually have a Stamp involved someplace in there, sure. so sure. this is kind of coming up to the. Uh, um, this is kind of coming up to par with neighboring states. You go to North Dakota duck hunting, South Dakota pheasant hunting. Um, you know they're all in that type of, uh, and of course they only let you hunt for 15 or 10 days, okay. and so you can hunt all season for uh, a non-resident license here for $112. Yeah, I'm thinking about the three-day license. Um, a lot of non-residents come here for a week, maybe a partial week. Maybe they come. Uh, the, the travel time is, uh, you know, three days out of that week. They got four days left. They can hunt for three days for 
what, $75, $75. I guess. $75. Um, I'm thinking like the, the grouse society comes here and hunts, come from all over the country. We got the best grouse hunting in the country, by the way. Everybody, yep. I don't know if everybody locally knows that, but you talk to, how you find that out is you talk to the grouse hunters that come from these states. You have the best grouse hunting right here right. in Itasca County. That's right. And, um, you know, whether uh, sometimes we think so or not, because it isn't like the old days. The locals think about the old days when you could go out and get a limit every time. But still, compared to other states, it's, it's really something. So now they got an opportunity, if they want to hunt for three days for a, a little bit cheaper, Right. Uh, it's available now. Yep. So what you're doing is you're, uh, all you see is accommodation, accommodation here through this whole license uh, initiative and fee increase thing which is uh, interesting because uh, you've used consultants, you know where your figures are, and you know what's needed now, and you're just trying to get this applied uh, to, to the, the sustainability of this uh, thing. So, um, And I, I guess if I could add one other thing is that it's a, when, whenever there is a license fee increase, we usually see a certain percentage of participants drop out for a couple of years. And so, oh. and before they come back and buy a license. So by not having certain, you know, your kind of your main licenses uh, go up that big of a jump, mm -hmm. we hope to retain that and not see that yeah. fall out right after sure. a, 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 an increase. Sure, and all the, the uh, non-resident fees, uh, probably it's still the best deal out of any of them is, uh, Dave, is the fish, fishing. It's a pretty good deal, I mean, yeah. You know, uh, uh, Tom, yeah, you know, I've, I've I know where you're coming from when you go out and check fishermen, uh, especially when you get a little bit farther west here uh, during the week, uh, like on Lake Winnie and some of those areas. Uh, uh, sometimes you can go out 90% of the fishermen you check are from out of state. Right. And, especially uh, weekends. 90% uh, are from out of state, like especially during the week. Right now, this this time of year right now, 90%, this time of year might be, uh, 90 of our fishermen on Lake Winnie right now are right. out of state fishermen yeah. after the perk. And, uh, for, you know, and they're coming over here because of the, the product that they're catching. I hope they're coming over here because of the quality of the uh, environment and the fishing and the, and the experience that they have and that they get here. But, uh, you know, for, for the price of a non-resident fishing license, uh, and if you're looking at just uh, the terms of meat that they can take back, um, they're, that's a pretty darn good bargain. I mean, when you look at, let's say they can take, what, uh, they can possess 40 perch apiece. Uh, I don't know how many pounds would be in 40 perch, pounds of Winnie perch, but I know that uh, in, in some of the older days, not that old, not that far away, uh, some of those fish are going for $15 a pound mm -hmm. uh, perch. And then you, you can add on the walleyes, if they're fishing walleyes during the walleye season, the northerns and all that. Uh, uh, that's about the best bargain you can get for going on any type of a trip anywhere and have to pay a license for something. Yeah, and I, I, I think, think for most of them, the license itself is kind of a non-issue. They're spending hundreds of dollars in gasoline, $1,000 plus a week for lodging. <laughs> right. You know, the cost of the license really isn't that big of an expense no. to them. Especially uh, in the summertime when you see some of the equipment out there. Right. Uh, license is just uh, a minor deal. And like you said, Tom, it's uh, compliance is almost 100%, isn't well, it, Tom? It's that? really good uh, compliance. People are really, they know that, you yeah, know. It's, it's, it's part of the culture now. It is. It didn't used to be. The demographics have really changed. And, yeah, uh, really People has. aren't really passing on that that uh, negative yeah. aspect of it to their kids. You know, they're really teaching yeah. their kids to do the right way now. So, so when you go out and you check uh, a pile of boats, during the day, during the summer, um, you're pretty much expecting those folks to have and be licensed up for everything that they're doing. Uh, so uh, what you're providing them as a conservation officer is uh, information a lot, isn't it? I'm an information officer now, you know. Uh, That's they'll good. ask me lots of questions, which is great, you know. We, uh, we give lots of information to individuals of the public. They might ask me, hey, where are the, where are the bluegills biting? I might give them a tip. Is so it going to be a true tip? Well, I, I hope so. I try to be honest. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm out there, you know, just trying to be the face of the DNR and direct them in the right ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, people have been really well, really good. Well, they, they like to the see you out years. there because uh, uh, there aren't too many people that don't have a question for a conservation officer. Right. You know, especially if you ask them. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's right. I got a question or right. whatever. And doesn't it make you uh, nowadays, I think, more than in the past, uh, 
want to get involved with these two other gentlemen? Definitely. I mean, and, and their information and their because the questions you're getting are going to involve these two divisions, ask fisheries me, and wildlife. Yep. They'll ask me how many walleyes were stocked in this lake this year. Yeah. Well, you know, when I usually before summer goes, they'll they'll put out a fisheries will put out a list of how many walleye fry, you know, how many mm -hmm. pounds, how many millions of walleye fry were stocked, and it's good to know on those big lakes, you know, our local lakes like Bakagama, how many walleye were stocked this year, and people ask that. So I try to go into the offices with these guys, and we're really intertwined. You're right. Yeah. The, the management of the the fisheries and the and the uh, and the animals and all that are really intertwined nowadays with enforcement and uh, just getting that word out to the public. Sure, yeah. and probably it's probably going up to the next step now for you is why did they stock this particular lake? Now that involves more science, right? And stuff. Right. But you're, you're still you still can get that information, right? right. And, and that's it's all changed. So it's really a two way street for us too yeah. because. Um, you know, we don't have the opportunity. There was a time when we could uh, go out and do more of these creel type surveys where we'd go out and ask uh, a series of questions of the anglers. Well, we're not able to do that so much anymore because of the cost involved. But we find that our local conservation officers are a great source of information. Uh, Bass Lake's a great example in Cohasset where we have a special bluegill regulation. We can go to them and find out in relative terms how many people are fishing. Does this seem like a popular regulation? Are people catching fish? And, it, and it's a great source of information for us as well. Yeah, interesting. Um, some of these monies that are going to be coming in, you know, one of the prime things is we want to get the youth involved. Uh, you got to continually get youth involved in outdoor activities. Otherwise, that's the future. We're, we're eventually going to start seeing things go downhill. We are seeing license sales flat and some of them going down. And a lot of it has to do with youth involvement. But what kind of programs are out there? I mean, is there, are there things that are going to involve in the future youth education, youth involvement to get them out hunting and fishing. We've got a lot of single parent families and uh, some of these kids just don't have a chance to do this. Uh, what's out there? Well, I think, um, you know, with, with a license fee increase, I think the answer is yes. We certainly want to focus on outreach and education, especially to youth. And in the past, we've had a couple of different programs in fisheries. Um, the first one is called uh, Fishing in the Neighborhood, where we uh, and it's it's kind of based more in the metro area where there's higher densities of people and higher densities. That's of where youth. it should be based. Right, but you what bet. we do is we have uh, ponds that we manage as neighborhood fishing ponds, and we'll regularly stock them with fish, and be sure that kids have a nearby opportunity to go fishing. And then the other program that we've had is our Minocqua program, uh, where we've actually had educators that are able to go to schools or work with. Uh, groups of children and talk about fishing, talk about aquatic education. Uh, and these have been some really good programs that have reached a lot of youth. Um, but where we're at financially, w when it comes time to start cutting things, you have to look at, you know, are you going to cut some of these outreach programs? Are you going to cut back on stocking? Uh, so without a fee increase, we have some really tough decisions that we're going to have to make. Sure. Very good. Okay, so there's some involvement there. Enforcement, that's a tough one. You know, we get out in the communities, we're out in the community, whenever we can, we take a chance to try to get out and go to the schools mm -hmm. and talk to the right. schools, bring them in, maybe uh, furs, certain amounts, to educate the, the, the children in, of the area communities on what's out there and what can be used and to, to promote them to get out there and look at these animals and maybe go fishing. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it really goes back to the home. You know, is yeah. is if if the parents have been involved uh, in the outdoors, whether the kid's gonna grow up in the outdoors and enjoy it. So we, you know, we try to get out there we're, as we're part of the community and in these schools um, with our firearm safety classes, ATV classes, and all these, and promote these other things that are out there. Yeah, and, you know, going into a school with a uniform to a fifth and sixth grader. And giving a talk that they, they can really, you know, they're just, they're just, uh, their eyes are right on you. Uh, sometimes it only takes one shot yeah. to get them to go home and uh, ask mom or ask dad about uh, this particular subject. And uh, sometimes you never know how much you're accomplishing. Right. And something yeah. like that. And wildlife, what do you, what do you got there? Well, we have we have a full-time person staff down in the, in St. Paul that uh, works. Uh, um, primarily on the special youth hunts and we have a variety of a lot them. of those in there we coordinate yeah. a lot of a uh, lot of hunts like in state parks mm -hmm. for youth we have a youth uh, turkey weekend we have uh, um, you know there every legislative session there's something you know new that's loaded in with uh, deer hunts and that sort of thing for youth 
and where the youth hunt should be. There's a lot of discussion if it should be separate. We have a youth waterfowl hunt, um, and uh, we also have, uh, 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 I'm pretty sure it's part of ours, is the Becoming an Outdoors Woman. You talked about the single uh, parent families uh, getting Getting the uh, mom involved uh, is also uh, head of household, uh, interested in hunting, and so that's kind of where we are. We are working towards is is providing more opportunities, looking at things that either through rule or, or legislation make it easier for youth to become involved. Um, and in the in the fee, like I think I mentioned before, the the license fees for. Uh, uh, Persons under 16 or under seven, under 18, sorry, mm -hmm. are half price, both for angling and, and hunting. So there's a lot of things to try and uh, get those youth involved and and uh, participate. Okay, well, you know, folks are watching this and they're they're looking at uh, you know where their money's going and the value that they get from those dollars, um, and they also want. Uh, the divisions and the department to con control costs the best they can. Uh, what what are you doing to control the costs? What is the department doing to control the costs right now? That seems to be a big thing with everybody because that's just the way things are now because things are getting more and more expensive. There's less less uh, money out there to spend on this type of thing. What's the DNR doing? Well, uh, one of our uh, big things that we've done uh, is we've cut our mileage by 10% uh, within the last, I believe, eight or nine years. Um, as a, as a uh, wildlife manager, I just don't jump into a four-wheel drive truck and drive to the cities anymore. We have a number of uh, okay. fuel-efficient cars, um, and uh, we, we've tr traded in some of the, the bigger vehicles. We schedule our you know when we use these vehicles and so we've saved a fair amount on uh, just driving and then of course fuel savings as well and uh, and now we've uh, in our region in the northeast region we've restructured our personnel that we are actually going to probably get by or with 10 percent less folks uh, mm -hmm. right now because of our budget in mm -hmm. the, the state it's in we have uh, um, through Retirements, we have lost uh, seven, uh, well, actually, seven and a half positions out of 30 for our region. And the plan is if we get a fee increase, that we would only bring uh, uh, three or four of those back uh, to be rehired. So we've, we've mm -hmm. redesigned how we deliver our services and we've already made some cuts. So it, it's yeah. uh, both ways, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and we always look at different ways uh, to uh, to um, you know cut more costs but primarily sure. right now it's you think twice about sure. going moving places sure. with with sure. the high cost of fuel so. well you're looking at efficiency right, right. that's right. the best thing you can do all fisheries the same way pretty much cost board yeah Something like that yeah yep um, you know <laughs> fleet is one of our biggest expenses yeah. besides sure. personnel so one thing that uh, we're doing is we're getting rid of some of our wontons um, the trade-off is that's what we use to haul our fish. We put the big distribution mm. tank on them. So now we have to plan a lot better, be a lot better at logistics when we're hauling fish to try to do that more efficiently. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is we're purchasing more of our walleyes privately when uh, it comes time to do our fall stocking. Uh, and then we're able to get large, fish, uh, large shipments of fish at one time, which is more cost efficient. Uh, but we've also had staff reductions too. We've been in kind of the same position as wildlife with retirements. Uh, we've actually had about a 15% reduction in staff. Uh, so all of these things help. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, I can see you're, you know, you're trying to do it. You're trying to get more efficient. Uh, enforcement has always had, uh, it, it seemed like when I worked for them, they always had a money problem. Uh, just uh, because uh, your job is almost unending. It, 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 you, you can work and work and work, and there's never an end to it. Uh, what's going on in your division on that? Right. Um, like both these uh, wildlife and fisheries, uh, Dave and Perry are telling you, 
ninety percent of our budget goes to people's salaries and to mm -hmm. fleet. Um, we we very minimal. We don't have any programs really. I mean, that's what our money's going to. So what we've done is we've cut mileage three thousand miles a year, which means a lot when we have so many vacancies across the state. We've got CEOs covering conservation officers actually locally in the Grand Rapids area covering multiple stations. We've got vacancies to the north and to the south. So if you look at what I'm covering right now, I'm covering about 2,000 square miles right That's now. That's three stations. By, correct, because we have vacancies to yeah. the north and to the south. So that's going on around the state. So we're trying to go extra places with less miles. It makes it tough to, to, get, to, yeah. those, to get to those calls that we need to go to. So we're, yeah. um, we're trying to balance that out and, and uh, work with that. Also, you know, we're looking at the next five years of uh, another 15, 20 retirements, over 30, 40 officers. So we'll be down well over a third, almost getting close yeah. to that, yeah. you know, almost half of our, you know, five, six years if we don't have another uh, academy uh, for officers um, if the money's not there. I'm just thinking about covering three stations. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know how you, you can possibly feel like you're doing any kind of a job there. I, three stations up in Itasca County compared to three stations in southern Minnesota is a big difference. You look at the number Especially of, all year. You look at the number of lakes we have in oh. Itasca County, thousand, yeah. you know, thousand lakes that you have to cover and try to get to. Yeah, you're when you're sitting at home, you know, on time off, you're thinking, Boy, I gosh, maybe I should be out there right now and it's yeah. it's going you're always thinking that right now with the vacancies. So you're, you're trying to get the service to the people, which is needed, but it's really tough without, without the people. I suppose the way you, the way you work uh, changes a little bit too. You, you really focus probably in your job more on you know, where I should be at that particular time rather than just throwing a dart on the, on right. the map. Where the most user is going to be. Yeah, and, and the information coming in from the public, and maybe I should be over here. And uh, quite, quite an amazing um, amount of, of territory to cover for something like that. And uh, that might not change in a while. You might be uh, involved with that for quite a while. Of course, all the divisions have personnel problems when it comes to overlapping and, and under, under stationed areas too, right? I mean, I, I would imagine fisheries, you have people that you should have staff that you don't. Some we, places. We've got some uh, offices, you know, that that's the one it's problem part of, with letting retirements right. dictate where yeah. your vacancies sure. are. There's some offices that are absolutely decimated. Yeah. There might be two or three guys left in an office yeah. that used to have six or seven yeah. staff so, members. There you go, and you just yeah, mentioned the wildlife thing. It's so. the same thing. Uh, we have uh, yeah. the Badaft office is empty now yeah. due to uh, transfers and yeah. retirements. I got a question for uh, Perry here. Uh, you know, uh, one, one of your areas that you cover is like uh, wildlife management areas, like um, let's say the mud goose wildlife management area. Mm -hmm. Is that in your district? Right. Yep. Okay. Uh, real quickly, what, what do you try to accomplish with mud goose wildlife management area? That'd be one of your jobs. What's well, primarily mud goose was formed and organized primarily for the waterfowl yeah. resource there. It was, uh, we had a two uh, two large wild rice lakes that basically didn't have any water level uh, management there. It had no dam, um, and so the uh, and the Leech River is channelized in that point, so that when water levels are high, it's very high, and during the uh, later part of the year, oftentimes water levels get low, and so. Prior to uh, 1958, it would go dry about the time people were going to harvest wild rice or go di duck hunting out there. And that's, it was established in 1958 with the construction of the first, or one of the, of the mm -hmm. first dam that was operated by the DNR. And we try to, as best to our ability, uh, although we're at the whims of the Corps of Engineers about managing water there, but we're, the goal there is to manage uh, the wild rice crops there and, and the subsequent waterfowl that use it. And with that, it's a destination area. We have a number of public use facilities on those on those lakes that uh, we need to maintain. And uh, and that's the primarily the primary thing there. We also have a um, oh, about 10,000 acres of public land within that, and we coordinate with the uh, um, we coordinate with the the land other land managers foresters sure. on timber sales and uh, and with that then we have hunter walking trails throughout those areas 
for public access. It's uh, close to mostly close to motorized use, especially yeah. ATVs. And so we provide opportunities for the the uh, the uh, hunter on foot to uh, and through trails and that sort of thing. So it's habitat management plus a, a fair amount of user facilities there that we maintain as well. Okay. And it uh, you know some of it's pretty mundane, but you know when there's when the when there isn't a load of gravel in the right spot and somebody gets <laughs> stuck, it's it's mouth. it's a big problem for somebody. Yeah, and anytime so. anytime you have management, you always have uh, enforcement because there's always rules, right? I mean, uh, you know, there's always rules, and more of it rules now. It seems to be with uh, off-road vehicles and ATVs and things like that. Uh, then there's an area that's clo it's closed during uh, the waterfall season to motorized vehicles on the lake too, isn't it? Right, we yeah, have. So yeah. you got to enforce that. You yep. see some of that, and uh, there's a good fisheries over there too. By the way, a lot of people don't realize <laughs> mm -hmm. in that area. It's probably one of the more underfished areas. Right. Yeah. Some of the areas. So, uh, not that we're giving anybody a hint here. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Okay. The last question we have is um, this: this proposal. It's uh, a hunting and fishing initiative, is what they call it. Legislatively, that's what they call it. Uh, where is the proposal right now? As uh, and toward the end of March here. What are we looking at? Is this thing going to get passed? Uh, does it look like it's going to get passed? If it doesn't get passed, do we have to wait a year or two years, or how does that work? Anybody? Well, uh, as to my knowledge from this morning is that I don't believe there's a bill been introduced in either in the House and Senate. The uh, the feedback that we have is that the legislatures can see a need. Um, they've feel our, the way we've prepared our proposal is, is very good, but we also have the, uh, um, uh, at least from the Republican con caucuses, that there's no new issuance of fees uh, going to, you know, they're mm -hmm. not going to be receptive to any type of tax or fee increase. So it, it uh, there really hasn't had any tr traction except for the fact that it's in the present, or present, the governor's budget in his proposal. So Senate, or Governor Dayton has, uh, in his uh, budget proposal, has allowed for a, a fee increase for hunting and license fee, hunting and fishing okay. licenses. Yeah. If um, <clears throat> if this doesn't pass, is this a two-year? You have to wait two years, or is it possible to bring it up next year too? It, I, I, I don't it, know how that works. I guess in my. Uh, my retrospect, uh, last time we had a fee increase, it, it, it ran for two years. We, we went and made an initiative the first year, it didn't go, and we went the second year and it went sure. through in 2001. So I would assume that we would uh, attempt to do it again in, in, yeah. uh, in the next year. And, and by uh, even at our reduced l rates in personnel and operations, we, we will be operating in the red by the fiscal year 2014. So um, then we'll have to look at not just retirements, but layoffs sure. as well. And le less services, of course. Less services. And Dave, that comes to you. Uh, if this if this wouldn't pass, and let's say it wouldn't pass even by 2014, uh, uh, logically, would there be less fish planted? Uh, I think at some point there would have to be, just because that's such a large cost. Um, the, it probably would mean uh, fewer fish planted. One of the biggest problems is going to be with salaries being our number one cost. We, it, it's physical work to produce these fish. We need guys at the uh, fish runs to collect the eggs. We need guys to harvest the ponds. Sure. We need guys in the hatcheries. And it's, it's pretty expensive to do that. So at some point I would think uh, there would at least have to be some pretty serious discussion about reducing the number of fish that get stocked. Okay. Well, that's, that comes down to the... Uh uh, you know the dirt of the subject right there is uh, you know what's going to happen to the resources if if this thing isn't passed eventually. Right, and, uh, we're we're to the point without the fee increase, we'd we'd have to take a serious look at some of the very yeah. core things that we do, and these are the kind of things that yeah. you know down the road the average sportsman would notice that that's start noticing different sure. here. And Tom, you would probably be uh, still uh, covering uh, two or three stations if this <laughs> <That's correct. laughs> didn't cover. But you know, you aren't the only officer out there doing that. There's uh, many, many officers that are covering more than their uh, legitimate uh, 600 acre or 600 square miles or 650 yeah. square miles uh, around the whole state. Right. And it's not that the, uh, the wardens, the conservation officers in uh, southern Minnesota, are, are less. Uh, 
Um, I mean, they have, they have a job to do down there, too. There's a lot of things going on all over this state, not just in Itasca County. The, the officers I know in this state are, are really overwhelmed with work, no matter where they are, really. Uh, so it, it does affect everybody in Minnesota, that's for sure. Anything else you want to add, anybody, uh, on this initiative? I don't think so. Pretty well covered everything here. I, I suppose if there's any questions the public has on this, they can... Uh, Call the Department of Natural Resources on Highway 2. and Certainly, yeah, and we have uh, a lot of this information is available on the DNR website now. Okay. So that's an excellent source of... Just go uh, to the DNR website uh, and you'll find uh, at least up to the date um, information. Yep. Especially yep, with this correct. proposal, yep. you'll find yep. on a daily basis what's going on. And it's pretty hard to go a couple of days uh, on the local news without hearing something about this mm -hmm. going on or in the local newspapers. So, yeah. Well, thanks for coming in, uh, Dave. Tom, Perry. Thank you. Yeah, thanks really for having appreciate us. it. It uh, shows a good uh, uh, round structure of uh, what's going on in Grand Rapids at DNR and on the state level. And so uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you folks for watching Just Outdoors. And remember, stay informed.